Good evening. We are on board the Royal Caribbean Cruise Line, and we are filming a jazz archive for Hamilton College. Our guest today is Mickey Roker. Thank you. <laughs> Glad to be here. Yes. Let me just uh, ask you, um, when did you get started playing, and who were some of the, the people that you were influenced by? Well, I started playing drums when I was about maybe six years old, and mostly military drums, uh -huh. marching bands, stuff like that. And then I got drafted into the Army, and that's when I decided I wanted to play swing, a set of drums. So everybody that played drums was a big influence on me, you know, because when you don't know anything, everything is exciting, you know. Uh -huh. But, you know, later on, after I learned about the drums, I, 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 I fell in love with Kenny Clark and Papa Joe Jones mm -hmm. and Vernal Fournier. Oh, so many people, you know, Philly Joe Jones. But the guy that I listened to when I, in my developing stages in Philadelphia was a drummer named Spex Wright. Because Philly Joe Jones had already gone by the time I started playing. I didn't start playing until 1956. I got drafted in 1952 and I got out of the Army in 1955. So that's when I started to play, practice and practice, and I'm still trying to learn how to play. <laughs> <laughs> uh, who did uh, you get some of your first gigs with? Well, I played rhythm and blues in Philly with uh, a, a, a band, a guy named King James. I did that for a year in a group with Jimmy Devine called High Five. We had a band together for about a year. And then I decided that playing that way is so limited, you know. Mm -hmm. So I devoted my life to playing jazz because it's more free, it's open, you know, and you can express more rhythm. Uh -huh. So then I started playing with people like Sam Reed, all these Philadelphia musicians and Jimmy Heath, and uh -huh. Jimmy Oliver. Jimmy Heath is the guy that introduced me to Milt Jackson uh -huh. years ago. So then in 1959, I went to New York to play with Gigi Grice. Uh -huh. So I played with Gigi Grice for a couple of years, played with Ray Bryant for a couple of years, and then that's when I joined Joe Williams' band with, with Junior Mance Trio. Tell us about uh, Joe, how do you feel his his voice typifies jazz vocals. Because he can really sing the blues. And if you play jazz, if, if, it's, if it doesn't feel like the blues is involved, then it's classical. Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> jazz, the basics of jazz is the blues. That's the emotional well. Right. You know, the, the, you know, the, the gospel feelings, you know, even even the, the greatest saxophone players, the greatest instrumentalists, they they know how to put blues into their statements, you know. Uh -huh. Not to say that they got to be playing blues like B.B. King, I mean right. just the feeling, the happy feeling of the blues, you know. Mm -hmm. Now that's now that's something I, I want you to talk about. You said the happy feeling right. of the blues. Okay, yeah. now elaborate on that. <laughs> well, you know, the blues have many faces, you know. Mm -hmm. Some people cry, man, the old lady left them and all that, but sometimes you, the blues can be happy, man, because it's a feeling, man, that generates the spirit of Christ, which makes you happy. You know what I mean? You, 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 you're saved, I mean, you're free, as pure, as clean. So, so that's, that, that type of blues is what I'm talking about, you know. Like Milt Jackson, the way he plays the blues. It, it makes you want to jump up and dance, you know. <laughs> and so that's happy, you uh -huh. know. That kind of blues, that's uh -huh. what I mean. The, the, the thing I wanted to, the, to say about that, and then you, you kind of elaborate on this, is in the African-American community, it, it, it came that when you play the blues, you express yourself. You don't just execute notes, black dots on a page. You express yourself. With emotion, with, with emotion. With emotion. And the freedom involved in that became a kind of 
unspoken but musical camaraderie. Mm -hmm. In other words, when, you, when I hear you play that blues, I can tell that that cost you something experientially. Oh yeah, you, you, <laughs> you express your life, you express the way you live. You know, like some, some people that go to school formally, I'm not saying all, but some people, they tend to play too classically. Mm -hmm. So it's something that has to be in you, I, I believe. I think you have to be blessed. You have to be blessed. You have to have a certain talent for being able to to play the blues and, and to really play the blues with you know, with feeling, even though you playing maybe rhythm changes, mm -hmm. but it should still swing like like the blues, mm -hmm. you know, like the gospel. Mm -hmm. Should always have that feeling in there, you know. Mm -hmm. And that's one thing about Joe Williams that I like. You know, he not, he's so versatile. Mm -hmm. He can sing a he can sing a ballad, and it's soulful. And he can sing an up tempo tune, and it's soulful. But he can really sing the blues. <laughs> and and it, it's not jazz unless you have the blues instilled in there somewhere. So you can't learn it all out of a book. Well, it's nice. You got to. You, you should have something in your head too, but you should also have something in your heart. And that's, that's what the blues come out of, not, you know, out of your heart. Now, I want to ask you a, a question. I know that you're, you're, you're capable of this because you just talked about it. But when you think of the blues, you think of either a blues singer, a blues guitar player because he can bend them strings, or maybe a sax player. But how do you transfer those sounds to the drum kit? Well, you, 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 rhythm is our business. See, we don't play changes on drums. We play rhythm. So we think in terms of, you see somebody walking down the street, it takes a certain rhythm. You think about life. You know what I'm saying? And you take your music and you express what you've lived and what you see. You see what I mean? The blues is something, that's a feeling that's, it should be in you, you know, from your grandmother, sitting on your grandmother's lap and she say, uh, you know, go to sleep a little baby. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> baby, you know? <laughs> so that's in you from, from, a, from a kid, you know? Uh -huh. So, you know, you go to school and learn academics, uh -huh. you know, so that you can play with a bunch of guys that you don't even know because you have the music. Uh -huh. But you should never forget the what's in your heart, what you learned from your grandmother, you know? Uh-huh, uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us about uh, playing with Dizzy. Now, that was, that was an experience for me. I, I mean, that'll last me all my life. I, I'm from Philadelphia. Now, I live at 12th and Catherine, and Dizzy's mother lived in the 1300 block of Catherine Street. So I've been seeing Dizzy Gillespie because he has a nephew that he Ray, he took care of. You know, his brother died, his oldest brother died. So he assumed the responsibility for his nephew. So the same with in my family. You know, my uncle and my grandmother raised me. So Dizzy's mother and my grandmother, they used to go to the same church. So me and Dizzy's nephew, we went to school together. So I've been seeing Dizzy Gillespie all my life. So finally, one day after I've been in New York for a while, I was working with Lee Morgan at the time, and he loved Lee Morgan, so he used to come to hear us all the time. So he heard me and he liked me, so he asked me to join his band, you know? And it was nine years of, of one of the greatest experiences I ever had in my life. He's a strong man, he knows a lot of music, and he knows rhythm, man. He can teach you rhythm, I think every drummer should have a chance to play with Dizzy Gillespie, you know, when he was alive. Or they should really study his music. Everybody should, he's, he's uh, him and Charlie Parker is the reason we play the way we play now. There's nothing newer, you know, there's nothing newer than the way him and Charlie Parker play, you know. Uh, now, uh, something I want to ask you about and then, uh, as, pertaining to Dizzy, and then you kind of plug me into it as a drummer. You know, Dizzy was influential in bringing the Afro-Cuban beats right. into the bebop and into other styles. Right. 
And uh, that's something that, uh, you know, you're a specialist in. You're pretty good at that. Well, you know, I do the best I can. <laughs> <laughs> tell us about how, what, how that affects the sound and how that changes the, the, the style. Well, he, he loves rhythm. He loves rhythm, you know, and he, he's like the king of bebop, you know what I'm saying? He's been titty boom, you know, titty boom. So he, he fell in love with Channel Pozo, you know, and, and, and Potato Valdez. You know, and Big Black, these are great conga players. And he, he just loves that kind of music. And for me, it was beautiful, man, because he taught me some rhythms, taught me six, eight rhythms and, and, and you know, in Latin, different Latin beats, but he loves six, eight rhythm uh, that are so simple, but still complicated. Mm -hmm. You mm -hmm. know, if he, if he don't show you, you it's, it's even hard to conceive of these rhythms, you know. And it's hard to ex for me to express because it, I had to learn it from him, you know. <laughs> but he's a great man, man. He, Dizzy Gillespie, he's, he's, he knows everything about music, man. And he just loved, you know, the Afro-Cuban beat, you know, and infiltrated into jazz, you know. You know, uh, jazz, what kind of separates jazz from other forms of music, like European classical music, is the vitality and the pervasive nature of rhythm. Could you elaborate on that and tell us how, how that rhythm is different, in, particularly in the African-American community and in, and in the way it enunciates jazz than, than rhythm in other styles of music or other cultures? Well, I think it's, it, an eighth note is an eighth note, but it's the way it's, the eighth notes are played. Some people play them like... But in the Afro community, it's... It's dotted. Uh-huh. That's the whole difference. Uh-huh. That's the whole difference. In, if you can play with that type of feeling instilled in your rhythm, then you have the blues and, and then you have Afro-Cuban all at the same time. Because they play. You hit a 6-8, you 6-8, and then the, then the shuffle. And that's 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 the only that's the only difference is, is not because the notes are the same, but it's the way you play the notes. Uh -huh. And 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 it's just a feeling that you have to have. It's it, it's hard for me to explain a feeling. I'm not uh -huh. you know. <laughs> it's something that you have to do, you know, and 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 somebody have to teach you how to do it, you know. You know, another thing I wanted to ask you about learning this music. As you said, someone has to teach you, but then you also have to experience it. Right. You you learn under pressure, really. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's how you really learn. You it, it's not easy for young guys now to to get jazz gigs because there's there's not that many places for them to play. Uh huh. You know, everything is. If you look at TV, everything is more rock or or, or fusion, fusion. You know. You know. So. It's, it's, I think everybody has to pay their dues and get a chance to play this type of music because it's the newest music happening and and it's very uh, uh, how do you say it's very free you know it's 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 free but you really have to know your instrument you know in order mm -hmm. to be free that's the main thing is that if you know your instrument then you are truly free. In other words, it's almost a, a, a dichotomy by saying the, the more disciplined you are on the instrument, the more freedom you afford yourself. Right, sure. You, know, you also said that you learn under pressure. Mm -hmm. Give us, if you can recant, uh, uh, a, a, a situation in which you learned a new something under pressure. Well, when I first started to play, man, before I played my first gig, I start, I was practicing, practicing because I didn't go to, I couldn't go to, I couldn't afford to go to school. So I learned from friends, uh -huh. you know, and and we play. And I I went to this jam session one time, and I mean, he's talking about embarrassing, but it really made me go to go to work. You know, I learned 
a very valuable lesson that night. I went, it was time for me to play. Everybody had a time to play, you know? So they started to play, uh, that vaults hot, you know? Uh -huh, uh -huh. It's a three, four rhythm. Uh -huh. and, and, and I said, they say da 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 do 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 da da do do da. I say ding 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 ding. Uh oh, uh oh. Talk about polyrhythms. And 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 but I didn't know nothing about no polyrhythms back then. You know, you know. All I knew was because I was self-taught. You know, and I and I had never heard a waltz before. You know. Uh huh. I mean, not to know that it was a waltz. So anyway. I'm playing, I'm, and guys are turning around looking at me, man, and I'm wondering what's wrong because the beat ain't, it ain't matching up. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so, man, that's when I learned that there was a di this different rhythm other than 4-4. Four -four. <laughs> you see? <laughs> but I, if I hadn't gone to that jam session and put myself in a position like that, uh -huh. I never would have learned that. I, I mean, it would have taken me more time, you know, uh -huh. but because I went and, you know, I had enough of the nerve to get on stage. So anyway, uh, who pulled my coat is a great drummer named Donald Bailey. They call him Donald Duck. He used to play drums with Jimmy Smith. A great drummer, man. Common, he played with a lot of people. So he got me on the side and he, he said, man, you know, in, you know, in, in rhythm, some bars, some measures have four beats, some measures have two beats, some measures have five, three, five beats, some measures have f three beats, some measures even have seven beats, you know? And then that's when I learned that there was a different, you know, a di the, about, about the difference, uh -huh. differences, you know? Uh -huh. And so that was a great lesson for me, you know? <laughs> but you're talking about pressure, man. I started sweating, man. <laughs> But but it was it was beautiful, man. Because I I went and I practiced, man, and I practiced. And the next time I went to the jam session, they didn't play anything in three four. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. But that but that sense of, of of readiness. You know, you 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 said something else about the jam sessions. You know, when jazz first started moving into the colleges, mm -hmm. a lot of administrators didn't understand or even think that jam sessions were necessary. It's very important. But how else you gonna work your ideas out? It's very important, man, because they're good for, we used to have jam sessions every day of the week at, at different people's houses. Okay, Sunday was my day. They had jam session at my house on Sunday. You know, guys like McCoy Turner and Kenny Barron, Reggie Workman and uh, uh, Arthur Hopper and, uh, oh, a lot of the Philadelphia guys, you know, like uh, C Sharp and uh, and oh, oh man, most of the guys are around Philadelphia, you know, and uh, we would work tunes out, you know, that's mm -hmm. how we learned how to try to play jazz, you know, we would learn the song. You got to learn the music first. Mm -hmm. Then then you learn what rhythm goes, and then there are certain music, certain tunes well, you can put different rhythms on, you know? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It doesn't always have to be the same rhythm, you know? Mm -hmm. And that's what's so beautiful about jazz because it's, you can always do, you can do it differently. You don't have mm -hmm. to do it the same way the other guy did it, you know? Mm -hmm. you know and, that, and you learn, a lot of times you get a gig and they might, there might not be any music. Uh, and they might call a song that you don't know. You, you know what I'm saying? So that's how you learn under pressure, because you got to play this song. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So you might mess up the first chorus. You might, might make a mistake. But by the second chorus, you better have it down, see? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Or the third chorus, see? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And see, the, but the only way you can do that is you have to know your instrument. You got to really know your rudiments is, mm -hmm. from a rhythmic standpoint. You know, from a horn players, they got to know their changes, you know, and mm -hmm. their scales. and. But a drummer, drummers and percussion, I mean, you know, percussion players, you got to know your, your, your rudiments. And mm -hmm. You know, I want to ask you about taking a drum solo. Uh, you know, a lot of people don't really know how to listen to a drum solo. Many times uh, when a drummer takes a, a solo on the form, the audience isn't even counting anymore. You know, they're, they're not even staying with him. Well, Talk to us. 
Yeah. Talk to us about about the about the the whole art of taking a solo on a percussion instrument. Well, I, f the way I solo, I keep the melody in mind. Uh huh. I always sing the melody. See, drummers make great singers because they don't they don't get changes to play, so they have they they got to keep the melody in mind. Uh huh. And if you do that. You can put rhythm, you can, man, the rhythm is so infinite, man, you can, so much you can do, you know. But when people listen to a drummer play, they want energy, man, they want dynamics. Mm -hmm. They want the same thing that the drummer wants. It's up mm -hmm. to the, the guy taking the solo to sell himself to the people that's mm -hmm. listening. Mm -hmm. You know, it's up to the player to make the people want to listen to him. Uh-huh. So whatever you know, that's that's a soloing is uh, that's a, that's a different art. You know, some people can just solo, man. Some people are natural soloists. Some people have to really work hard to to really play an interesting solo. Mm -hmm. You know, cl and clever. You know, uh -huh. and still be basic. You know, I uh, had a chance. I was playing in an orchestra. I was playing a string bass in the string section. Mm -hmm. behind Ramsey Lewis one night. Uh -huh. And his drummer was basically saying he realized he was not a power drummer. So he got his excitement, he played a chorus, and about, you know, eight, about every eight measures, he got softer and softer uh -huh. and softer. He said, no, I'm not going to overpower this drum set. Yeah. I'm going to do it in just the exact opposite way. I'm going to give you the thing you don't expect. You don't expect the drums to be soft. So he started out pretty good. Mm -hmm. And then everybody, every eight measures, he got softer. He went down to a number of brushes on us. Yeah. Finally, he put the brushes down and said, just beat on the chest. <laughs> well, he's a showman. That was some showman stuff, uh -huh. you know? Yeah. You need some of that, too, you know? Uh-huh. But soloing is, uh, that's an art, that's a different art form, man. You know, because drummers, when I come up, we were mostly a company. Uh huh. You know, we might not get a solo all night. You mm -hmm. know, because most of the bands play dance music. Uh huh. And uh, you, you know, like you can tell if if a drummer has good time, if he gets a solo and he's playing dance music, if the people still still dance. Uh huh. Then he's playing with feeling and uh -huh. he's playing with pulse. Uh huh. You got to have pulse, you got to have feeling, you got to have dynamics. There's so much you got to think of just to get from one note to the other one. It's not all technique and, and, and uh, you know, energy. You, I mean, you, some drummers play a solo and they just play a lot of energy, you know, and, and uh -huh. there's no music. They don't forget about the music, you know. Uh -huh. So I think that a drummer should also be musical. Uh-huh because then it's easier to listen to, you know, and then everybody that you're playing with, they know where you're at. Uh -huh. You know, they know where you're at in the song, in terms of the song. Because you've got to play the song too, you know. Uh-huh, uh-huh. You know, they say that a drummer can't play with a band. He has to be ahead of the band because he's got to set up everything. Well, I don't say, I don't know about that. Uh -huh. I think that, I think, that the drummer I mean, and you the have bass to be thinking player, ahead. Thinking the drummer, ahead. Oh, well, I think every, everybody should think ahead. You know, and if you ha if you read, you have to read ahead. You can't mm -hmm. be playing here and and mm -hmm. reading here. You gotta you gotta see that, and then you're looking over here. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So, but as far as playing, the drummer and the bass player should be just like this, mm -hmm. just like one person. And it gives the soloists, they can play behind the beat. You know how little mm -hmm. Jimmy Scott sings? You know how little Jimmy Scott sings behind the beat? And to see, a horn players can p do that, piano players. But a drummer and a bass player, you got to march, just like a marching, you know? Just like a, you know, you got to be right on the beat. The designated driver. <laughs> yeah, you got to be right on the beat, man, you know? And it gives them a foundation from which to, you know, to, to throw their curveballs from, you know? Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, tell us some of the other uh, people that you've backed up. I noticed you, you, you worked with Nancy Wilson. Yes. Well, see, when I, f see when, when I first went to New York, I didn't know how to read music. 
You know, I, I studied for very briefly, then I got drafted in the Army. So when I came out of the Army, I went to New York to play with Gigi. Then I played with uh, Ray Bryant, then Joe Williams. When I left Joe Williams, I, I took a gig with Mary Lou Williams in, in the Hickory House. And I worked with her for about a year, off and on. Then she, she got sick. So during that time, I decided I was going to stay in New York for a while. So I got hooked up with Duke Pearson. And Duke Pearson more or less taught me how, uh, how to read, you know, because he had a big band. And then he asked me to join his big band. And then he would write out stuff for me. And then I started learning how I started to learn when I first started to learn how to read. So then I got the gig with Nancy Wilson because she had music for everything, uh -huh. you know. And, and that was beautiful, man, you know. That was, a very, that was one of the best jobs I ever had in my life with Nancy Wilson. She used to pay us when we was off, mm. you know. <laughs> I had never had that. Retainer, she gave us a retainer, you know. Uh -huh. Me and Buster Williams was the rhythm section. And a, and a piano player and a conductor named Don Trenner. So I, I did that for a while, and then I left there, and that's when I joined Lee Morgan's band. But during that time, when I stayed in New York, I made recordings with a lot of people like Stanley Turrentine and yeah. Horace Silver and Frank Foster, now, Donald Byrd. Now, now let, me, let me ask you about that, because you talked about Horace Silver. Uh -huh. uh, first of all, the, the hard bop period is like some of my favorite music. Yeah. You know, tell me about how that music feels from the inside out. Man, it's, it's heaven, man. It's, <laughs> it's strong. And I was young then, you know, we were all young guys, you know. And it was beautiful, man, because it was so exciting for me, you know, because I never in my wildest imaginations believed that I would be in New York playing with these guys I've been looking at all my life, you know. I always loved music, you know. And I could always play the drums, you know, but I never, you know, I was married and I had two kids and I had worked a day job in the beginning, you know, until I went to New York. So I never dreamed, man, that I would be playing with people like that I played with, you know. So I was always excited, man. It was, it was to me, it was like I died and went to heaven. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I want to ask you, uh, do you have any little funny little things that happened to you like on the bandstand or while you were traveling with a group? Little crazy things that may not, that the average person may not think has anything to do with the music, <laughs> but find its, eventually finds its way into the music. Well, that, that story I told you about that, me playing in 4-4 four, four and the music was in 3-4, that's about the funniest story I got, you know. Because, you know, there are a lot of stories, but, you know, I, I, you know, I can't think of one to tell you right now. Uh -huh. <laughs> Little funny stories. Uh. Tell us about working with Lee Morgan. Oh, that was beautiful, man. Now, that is, I got a funny story to tell you about Lee Morgan. When I was working with Lee Morgan, I, I was invited to his house for dinner one night, you know, when he, you know, him and Helen was together, you know. And they lived in, in, uh, in the Bronx. Yeah, they lived not near, not far from Yankee Stadium. So we're sitting there having dinner, and all of, before Lee Morgan, I mean Dizzy Gillespie and Art, they would come to, we playing slugs quite a bit. This club in the lower part of New York. So we're sitting there having dinner, and the phone rings, you know. So it, you know, I didn't know who it was on the other end, because Lee was talking on the phone. So I heard him say, man, I know why you coming around all the time, man, because you're trying to steal my drummer. And Dizzy was working at the Vanguard, you know, with his band. So Lee said, just for that man, I ought to come down there and burn on you. I'll bring my horn down there and burn on you, old man, you know? And there was a pause. And then all of a sudden, Lee Morgan just broke out laughing, man. I mean, he was hysterical laughing. So we're trying to find out what he, you know, what, what Dizzy said, you know? So Dizzy, he said, I said, said what did Dizzy say, man? So he said, what did Dizzy say? Don't come down here and get bruised. <laughs> uh oh, uh oh. <laughs> yeah. But I'm telling you, Dizzy, all the trumpet players call Dizzy Gillespie the king. Uh huh. I mean, he is the king on that trumpet, man. There's uh -huh. nobody can play that trumpet like Dizzy Gillespie. Uh huh. And you know, 
And, and so Lee was teasing, you know. He said, well, the boy don't come down here and get bruised. <laughs> Now that's something else I want to <laughs> talk with you about because see, this is all a part of the ed the education of, of jazz. It's the cutting contest. Yeah. You know? Well, that was more or less before my time, that cutting stuff. Uh -huh. When I came along, cats, cats were friendly and they, they were willing to help you. Oh yeah, you, I, don't, I don't, it wasn't always, it wasn't always to the to the death. He wasn't yeah. trying to yeah. try to. Put, I know, you know verbally cutting cats cut each other up musically. You, yeah. Is that what yeah. you're talking yeah. about? Yeah, yeah. Well, that only happened to people, man, who couldn't swing. Uh huh. They would get cut up, you know, uh -huh. because they would ruin the groove. Uh huh. Uh -huh. You know what I'm saying? That's what I mean about the blues. If you get a guy and he get on the bandstand and he play, da 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 da. You know what I'm uh -huh. saying? If he played too staccato, guys would cut him up. Uh huh. Because it should be more f liquid, fluid, you know? In other words, not so staccato, you know what I'm saying? Jazz is more legato. It's a legato art. You know? I mean, and then you instill a few staccato just to, for the differences. Uh huh, for very You know, to show your classical training, awareness, you know? But it's more legato instead of staccato. Wow, oh, yeah. Um, and that tell us, uh, for instance, how you go about trying to accomplish that legato nature. You on, listen on a to drum the, set. You listen to your. You listen to your ma the masters. You duplicate your masters until you. F find it yourself until you get it and then you can be yourself uh -huh. but everybody comes from somewhere uh-huh the history you know you listen to the guys that originated the stuff you listen to kenny clark you listen to art blakey you know what i'm saying uh-huh you listen to papa joe jones you see you listen to philly joe jones these are the guys that i like that i listen to to see just how they emphasize a phrase uh-huh you see what I'm saying? And and to see how they just take two bars and make a phrase. You know, and then you you try to do the same thing. Because you don't want to play the same phrase just the guy you might love him to death, man, but you don't want to play the same thing he played in the same place. It's, it it gets stale. You because jazz is not like that. I mean, this in the beginning when you're a kid all the young guys want to play sing, 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 like Gene Krupa. Uh -huh. You know, that was the show that you really listen to Gene, and you, man, I can play sing, sing, sing. But, man, you got to get away from that. You got to be yourself. Uh -huh. You got to learn how to be, express how you feel. See, and that's what's beautiful about jazz in, a, in, in, a, in, you know, in comparison with other musics. Uh -huh. Other musics, you got to be just like Bach or Beethoven or whatever, you know? Okay, we can be like Charlie Parker, but we can also be like ourselves. Uh huh. You know, and that's accepted as long as you're strong. Uh huh. You know. Yeah, yeah. Um, you mentioned earlier on in the in our talk about the gospel influences. Mm -hmm. Tell us how that finds its way into the music, and I want to uh, mention a term here, and then. Just you, you take off on it. Mm -hmm. There's a term in uh, that that deals with several West African languages called significant tone, and that means that the way that you pronounce a word, whether you give a higher inflection or a lower inflection to that tone, actually changes the meaning of the right. tone. Uh, and then, of course. Uh, I, I, I've, I teach in my, my courses that when people came here from West Africa and you play on a saxophone or a trumpet, but your language was one that, that, that used significant tone, you're still trying to get those inflections out of that inanimate piece of metal. Make right. that thing speak and give you the sound that you want back. Well, see, you, you have to, like, just say you, you want to play Latin music. You cannot play Latin music until you live and, I mean, you can play it, but it won't be authentic. Just like we, just like uh, 
we go to we might learn French. Uh -huh. We might go to school and learn how to speak French. Uh -huh. But you won't speak French until you go to France and live in France. See, music is an expression of life. Mm -hmm. You see, so you have to live. You got to live and be with people to be able to express how they feel musically. Because the music is, comes from the people, the soul people, the poor people, or the, the soul of the music, like the gospel, comes mm -hmm. from the poor people, the poor people of America, the people who've been abused, you know, the people who are, have a lot to cry about, you know, mm. and, and rejoice about, mm -hmm. you see? So that's, that's uh, you know, expression, it comes from people. And, you know, the music comes from the people. You know what, you understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. There's a thing I want to ask you about, and, and just, this is a term that I use, and see what you, how you feel about it. A thing that I call emotional truth. Mm -hmm. Now, I explained it like this. I said, there's truth, which we call just fact and then there's emotional truth. Right. Now, we all know that there was a Vietnam War. Right. That's a fact, that is true. But if you're talking to a mother who lost her son yeah. in that war, and she break down and cry while you're talking to her, now that's the emotional truth. Yeah. <laughs> you know well, what I'm people, saying? People, when some, see it's like looking at a picture. Some people look at a picture and they you see something completely different. You know what I mean? You know, if a mother lost her son and she look at a picture of the Vietnam War, man, she's going to be infect, affected quite differently than some guy that was in a soldier and got a medal for. Uh huh. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So that's you know that's what that is. You know. You know. Uh, let me ask you another thing about about jazz. Do you feel that, let's say, when a quintet is playing, piano, bass, drums, trumpet, Whatever. sax, that there are different levels that an audience can listen at? I think it's to the player. It's, a, it's, it's up to the players. What, because you can get a quintet and they might not be together. And if the audience listen, they're not going to enjoy it as much as if they listen to a quintet and the guys are together. Uh -huh. It's up to the players to make the people listen. You know, you demand, the player has to demand attention. Uh huh. You know, because the audience is, they're hungry, man. They want to hear whatever you got to say. Uh huh. So, if you say something that's intelligent and and and, and logical and and the truth, they you got them captivated. Uh huh. But if you go out there, man, caring more about the way you look or what you're wearing or, you know, or you playing just to try to get some chick or something. <laughs> I mean, how you gonna, you know what I'm saying? You got, it's serious. It's a serious how, business. In other words, how you gonna create something of great beauty if your motive is too weak? Right, you gotta soothe the savage beasts in people. Uh -huh. So you gotta be a dedicated player. P people, you can't fool them. You know, you can't fool people, man. They, they're hungry and they know the truth now. Uh -huh. they've, been, they've, they've listened to jazz for a long time. Uh-huh. So you can't fool them. They know when you playing and you play with the blues, or you playing with, and you got a lot of, or you just technical playing. Uh -huh, you, know? Uh -huh, mm -hmm. you know they know. You can't fool them now. You know, people will get up and walk out on you. You mm -hmm. know, or they'll stay there and listen. Let me ask you about that. What is one of the easiest audiences that you've ever played for? And what is one of the hardest audiences you've ever played for? I don't think there is a, such a thing, because if you are a dedicated player, you're going to play your heart out. I don't care if you're playing in the parking lot. You know what I'm saying? Sometimes you play a jazz mobile where you're riding in the street and you play for people in different neighborhoods. That don't mean that you should give up less there than you would give up in Carnegie Hall. Now, your dedication is too sad if you do that, you know. Uh -huh. So there's, you know, there's no easy audience and there's no hard audience. You know what I'm saying? The, what makes the audience is the player. Uh huh. You you're see? the catalyst. Huh? You're the catalyst. Right. You know, you you're the guy. You 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 the bottom line. They want to hear you, man. You, there's a big audience for people that can really 
speak intelligently and you don't have to be say every word in the dictionary but make people understand and love your sound uh -huh. and your you know your 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 approach it's, you know it takes a lot of dedication man to get from one note to the other one man let me ask you an elusive word and you just give me your definition of it however you can try to define for me the word groove groove <laughs> groove to me is a, a blues a term that epits the blues and when you when you playing and, and you look out in the audience and everybody's everybody's grooving <laughs> you know what i mean and you look in the audience man and, and you and you see everybody doing this that's groove that's a groove but if you playing something and everybody's talking about that's no groove uh-huh a groove, man, when you, when a player play, when a band is playing, or a player, it, it can be a solo guy by himself, two guys, ten guys, but if the feeling, see, that's the feeling of the blues, it's uh -huh. the groove. And uh -huh. you playing, man, and, 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 and it doesn't matter what tempo it is, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but usually a groove tempo is, when they say a groove, the tempo is usually mod a moderate tempo. Uh-huh. But that's not, you can groove in any tempo. Mm -hmm. But basically, people think of a groove, when you say a groove tempo, you know. Uh huh. And you look in the audience, man, and people are, you know, that's when you know, that's what groove means. In other words, there's a communication going on there. Oh, yeah. You can communicate without, without being a groove. Now, because sometimes you can play, you can play a uh, rubato or. Uh -huh. You know, uh, you know, without tempo, you know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know what I mean? And you can communicate. Uh -huh. But when you groove, there's a, there's a pulse. Yeah. There's a pulse happening, man. And, 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 and people feel that, man. And, and you, you know they feel it, man, because you can see them, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, I want to I wanna ask you something else, you know. Back to some aspects of, of church, particularly African American church. You know, when I listen to preachers, they're not necessarily singers, but I hear in their voice a certain cadence. Oh yeah. You know, and it's almost like it's mu uh, musical construction. Yeah, they blues singers. That's where <laughs> blues singers come from, man. <laughs> listen to them deacons. Get ready for the preacher. Uh huh. You know, uh, give, give us an example. Give us an example. Well, I'm not too good at you know <laughs> what they say. You know, but uh -huh. I can't really do it. You uh -huh. know, <laughs> but I know it when I hear it. You know, but but, but that's everything comes out of the church. You know, uh -huh. well, I, you know, the spiritual value of music is something that you must have. The spirit. That's what the blues. That's where the blues come from. See, it's the gospel. And then the, the, the Negro spirituals in the cornfields, because see, they took the drums away from us when we were slaves, uh -huh. because we could communicate with each other. Right. And they wanted to separate us, the slave masters, and when we were working on the plantation. So we learn gospel, we, we say, you know, we, we would, you, they would make up spiritual songs like, you know, get me, you know, you know, you know, lead me to the water, uh -huh. you know, or, you know, and they would, you know, send messages that way. Uh -huh. See, and out of that come the, the blues singer like Donna Washington and Sarah Vaughan, they come out of the churches and Mahalia Jackson, you know, oh, yeah. you know, she was a spiritual singer, but if you listen to, uh, uh, Aretha Franklin. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Oh, yes. Ray Charles. Yes. See, but, and then, it, it evolved, kept evolving, and then, then you got Charlie Parker, you got Coleman Hawkins, they started to swing in a little more, you know, and Ben Webster, and, and uh, you know, Benny Carter, and then it got more advanced with Dizzy Gillespie and Charlie Parker. See, but it all come out of them fields. See, it come out of them cotton fields, you know, with the Negro spiritual. It's real sophisticated now. You go in the church and they got drums and everything, bass, you know. 
I mean, dreadlocks. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. yeah. The Baptist churches. They got yeah. you go in and look on the pulpit, there's a set of drums up there with two tom tom toms all around, man. And bass and all, you know, and they, it's just sounding me just like James Brown and them. Uh-huh. You know, and you know. Mm -hmm. You know, now that the you were talking about the communication with the spirituals. Mm -hmm. Basically they would say if a man was working in a field next to a pretty woman and he was singing Steal Away. Mm -hmm. He wasn't talking about God. <laughs> he wasn't talking about, hey, I, are you, if you're half as tired of working as I am after you get off tonight, let's hook up. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, the beat goes on, you know. That's, you know, the, 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 even God said, go forth and multiply. You know, that's very important, you know. There's always a way, you know. Uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> you, you, you also talked about, uh, the uh, the drums in, in West African society being being a form of communication. Yes. And that was a form of, 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 of using significant tone. That's how they speak to each other, you know. Uh -huh. Whatever tone, you know, they had all kind of, you know, sounds for different uh -huh. messages that they wanted to send. Uh -huh. And not only the sound, but the way the sound was projected. Uh-huh. You know, it, you know, told, tells a story, you know. But you have to understand, you have to live, like again, like I say, you have to live in order to understand these sounds. There's no way you could, somebody that don't live there can tell you what these guys are saying. Uh -huh. You know, what they're, you know they're, what they're doing, they're sending messages, but you don't know what the message is. See, that's what made, made them take the drums away. Mm -hmm. Because you don't, they didn't know, they couldn't, they couldn't understand what these slaves were saying. Mm -hmm. So they just took the drums, you know. I mean, after they come to America, you know. And so that's how, you know. I wanted to, uh, I wanted to just share with you something that uh, I think is important. And then you give me your, 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 your feedback on it. You know, when I listen to music, particularly jazz music, and a lot of the great, particular African-American performers. There's an authenticity in that music that I get that refreshes me, that revitalizes me. Uh, it's something that, I, for instance, if I pick up an album of a player that I like, and I put that album on, even if I've never met that player, I feel like I've had a conversation with them, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, because he's give having one with you. Uh huh. You know, but the best way to hear music is live, if uh -huh. possible. I know it's impossible for a lot of young people because they can't afford to go hear music. It's very expensive to hear music now, nowadays. When I come up, it was inexpensive to go out and hear music, but we still had to wait till a certain age. So uh -huh. rec recordings was a way that we had to listen to these guys. Uh huh. You know. And the only thing about recordings is when you make a record, I made a lot of records, you, you stop. You can, if there's a mistake made, you stop. Uh huh. And you start, you know, you start. If somebody makes a mistake, not the side man, only the band leader. If the band leader <laughs> makes a mistake, you stop. But if the side man makes a mistake, you, you, you better you, catch up on the yeah, next beat. You yeah, know you, you live with it. Have to live with it. <laughs> yeah, you got to live with it. You know what one guy told me? is uh, he told me they would do two or three takes. Yeah. And he was a side man, but he would get a solo now and then. Yeah. So when he got a solo and did the burning, burning yeah. solo, he would go to the lead man and say, don't you want to keep take number two? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but see, they edit, you know, they edit, you know, they get to, they, uh -huh. go, they keep the take that the band leader sounds the best on. They don't right. care about what you sound like. Uh -huh. They care, I'm, you know what yeah, I mean. Yeah. But they care more about what they sound like. Uh huh. See, so you, when I've learned, man, that recording for me is hard because you try to play without making mistakes. Uh huh. See, so right then the music is classical. Uh -huh. You're thinking classically because there's no room for mistakes in classical music. But there, in jazz, live jazz. Uh huh. Just if you make a mistake, man, you can you can find because you gotta reach. 
You know, uh -huh. it's it's not a music where you just satisfied and you you play something that you know right now. You're always trying to stretch to play uh -huh. go a little further. That's how you 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 better yourself. Uh huh. But in classical music, man, you learn just the way that the composer intended. You play it that way every time. You see, you just develop your sound. Those cats have great sound. I'm not putting the music down. I'm just saying the differences in the two musics. Mm -hmm. All music is beautiful to me, mm -hmm. you know. But I'm just saying, even even in rock music, it's the same. You 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 got to sound just like the record. Uh huh. People want to hear a hit. if you if it's a hit, you know you can't change anything. Uh -huh. In jazz, you can change. You know you uh -huh. don't have to do the same thing all the time. You uh huh. Know? And that's refreshing. It keeps the music refreshed and new all the time. You know. Yeah. Because you can play a song ten times and every time it'll be a different solo. It'll be different. Uh huh. You know because it's not worked out. Then if it's worked out, then again it's going to the classics again. You uh huh. Know? Like it becomes chamber music almost. Right, you know, and that, that's boring after a while, man. It's like eating breakfast for egg, you know, bacon and eggs every morning. Uh -huh. You wake up every morning of your life and you eat bacon and eggs. Man, you get sick of bacon and eggs after a while, <laughs> man. <laughs> yeah. Well, I want to ask you as we kind of close here, um, if you had a encouragement that you could give to young drummers on the way up, just in a few words, what would you encourage them to do? I know you, you've talked about hearing li uh, the, the music live. Well, I think that the first thing they should do is cherish their friends. Because without your friends, you have nothing. I think you should stay clean, don't use no drugs. Don't use no drugs, don't smoke no cigarettes. You know, and then your mind is free to learn music. Mm. See, because you have to have a free mind. You can't be bogged down with side tracks. You know what I'm mm -hmm. saying? Mm -hmm. And But the main thing is to cherish your friends, man, because they're the only people that's going to call you for work is your friends. That's beautiful. Mm-hmm. No. We have been filming here on location on the Royal Caribbean Cruise Line. We've been talking with Mickey Roker, a fabulous jazz drummer who's played with many of the greats. And we are filming this jazz archive for Hamilton College. Thank you.